Ford. Welcome those of you who are joining us online. Thanks for being on whatever platform, like if you guys that are here on the platform, thanks for being here. <laughs> and those of you on Facebook, thanks for, thanks for joining us this morning, and especially those of you who are here in the room with us. Come thou fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing, call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious sonnet, sung by flaming tongues above. Praise his name, thy Fixed upon it, name of God's redeeming love. Hitherto thy love has blessed me, thou hast brought me to this place, and I know thy hand will bring safely home by thy good grace. Jesus sought me when a stranger, wandering from the fold of God. He to rescue me from danger, bought me with his precious blood. Play, Miss Kathy. Oh, to grace, how great a debtor, daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy goodness, like a fetter, bind my wandering heart to thee. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, oh, take and see. Feel it for thy courts above. Here's my heart, oh, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. I was reading this week in uh, Philippians, and I came across this verse, this uh, collection of verses, and it reminded me so much of this song we're about to sing. It, it's, it, this is what it says. Paul says in Philippians chapter 2, in your relationships with one another have the same mindset as Christ Jesus who being in very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage rather he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death even death on a cross therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You were the Word at the beginning, one with God the Lord most high. Hidden glory in creation, now revealed in you, our Christ. What a beautiful name it is, what a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a beautiful name it is, nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus. Our sin kept us from reaching heaven, so Jesus, you brought heaven down. My sin was great, your love was greater. What could separate us now? What a wonderful name it is. What a wonderful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a wonderful name it is. 
nothing compares to this. What a wonderful name it is, the name of Jesus. What a wonderful name it is, the name of Jesus. Death could not hold you, the veil tore before you, you silenced the boast of sin and grave. The heavens are roaring, the praise of your glory, for you are raised to life again. You have no rival. What a powerful name it is, what a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a powerful name it is, and nothing can stand against, what a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus. You have no rival, you have no equal. Now and forever, God, you reign. Yours is the kingdom. Yours is the glory. Yours is the name above all names. What a powerful name it is. What a powerful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a powerful name it is, and nothing can stand against. What a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus. What a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus. What a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus. How are you guys doing today? Fantastic, fantastic. Uh, well, great to see you guys. Uh, a shout out to um, to for those that prayed for Mr. Davin. Mr. Davin is here. <laughs> Yay! Amen. All right. Amen. We're, we're gonna stay away. We're gonna pray that you stay away from snakes. All right. No. Okay. And then pray for your dad too. Probably almost had a heart attack. <laughs> So anyways, I'll be freaking out. So uh, many of you guys know, pray for Davin uh, last week with um, the snake bite during a camping trip. So anyways, I'm glad you're here. Glad it's going well. And I think you've, you've um, basically cut off all the supplies for the anti-venom in that region of Texas, right? <laughs> so glad you're here. Be praying for Miss Janie, too. You know her battle with, uh, with Alzheimer's. Uh, be praying for her. Uh, we have many needs. Uh, today, I just kind of want to set the tone for service today. Obviously, we'll have service. We'll have a little uh, time to be praying for Afghanistan. Uh, I know some of you guys may know or may not know. Um, so we want to talk about that. Joy has a great report on kind of what we can do to pray together as a church. And then followed afterwards with the Lord's Supper. But if you look at your bulletins today, we've got a crazy week next week, a week from today on the 29th. After service, we will have our potluck, and the theme is, is what? Is faith, hope, and love, right? So we will be uh, supplying the burgers and the buns. All you need to do is to bring your favorite toppings, sides, and desserts, okay? And the sign-up sheet is in the foyer. Followed there, uh, we will have uh, our, can uh, our uh, youth associate youth pastor candidate, and his, his name is Hanny and uh, Nermeen, who will be here. Uh, we will have Q&A session after the potluck. So I want you guys to come. Youth, I strongly encourage you uh, to come and for uh, your parents to be able to come and join us, right? So 
that Q&A session there, and then we will have a special call business meeting uh, to vote on whether or not we want to proceed forward in calling um, Pastor Hanny uh, to be the youth pastor of our church. And then after that, we will close out and we'll have our third quarter business meeting. Okay, so uh, I know with business meetings, sometimes we don't get a lot of people, so I think this is a great time. So it's going to be an all-day affair, okay? So bring, we've got lots of food, so I anticipate the attendance to go up when there's food. So when we're going to do something, we're gonna, I think I'm, figure, I'm figuring this out. So everything revolves around food. So if we have food, we're going to fill this place up, right? So Amen. anyways, I hope it's that way pretty much every Sunday yeah. Yeah. <laughs> because we're getting our spiritual food. Amen? Amen. Spiritual food that will last for eternity. So, so anyways, that is the, uh, the, 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 the kind of platform uh, next week. Uh, we have other things. If you look at your bulletin as well, on uh, September the 5th, it's promotional Sunday. So kids move up the grades, so ch- classes may change. Just want to let you know, we do have some openings. If you want to co-teach with somebody, that would be fantastic for Sunday school. Uh, as you guys know, um, Sunday school is where we equip our students, right, in their age group to be able to share with them the goodness of God. We have teachers, our Sunday school teachers, that really invest in their time in preparing. So I encourage you guys to bring and be, uh, uh, participate in that and pers- encourage your students, your, your kids, to participate in our Sunday school for children. And we also have adult bu- uh, Sunday school as well with Wendell and Cynthia. On 9-11, we have our fall cleanup and church work day. So that is a Saturday. Just make sure we have some things to kind of clean up here at church. More information on that. Followed by the following week, the 19th, is our 23rd anniversary celebration. So feel free to see Robbie or Miss Anita regarding the plannings for that. Other than that, we've got quite a few things in the agenda, but I'll leave it to Carl to be able to pray Do we want to greet? Greet and then... This would be a great time to greet. Yes, go for it. Okay, I've been given permission to allow you to greet. <laughs> but I think I'm going to withdraw that. No, just kidding. Uh, so, you know, be, be mindful. Not everybody wants a lot of touchy. We're, we're still, a lot of us, uh, some of us are immune, uh, immune compromised, so be, be mindful of that. Um, but let's greet one another, and we can be friendly. And Davin, I just wanted to say, you know, we don't often get a chance to see the person, you know, face to face, like the week after. But it's really awesome to see you sitting there, buddy. Good to see you. Yeah. And and I know God answers prayer. Because you're sitting right there. I was really thankful for that. I know your parents are thankful <laughs> for that. I know your grandma and, and grandpa are very thankful for that. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> keeping an eye on them. That's awesome. So anyway, we just want to greet. Uh, so I'm gonna, we're going to play. Um, we're just going to play like the chorus of that previous song. Okay? We'll play like, like just the chorus. And you guys greet one another quickly and then, then kind of go back to your place. And gentlemen that are going to receive our morning offering, if you'd just come at the end of the, the chorus we play, we'll be ready to receive our morning offering. Okay? Ready? Set? Are you ready? Go. What a beautiful name it is, what a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus Christ my King. What a beautiful name it is, nothing compares to this, what a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus. Okay, that was the chorus, everybody. That's all right. All right. So glorious day now, Kathy. No, just a chorus. Just a chorus. Sorry. I know you are. I know you are. And that's a good thing. That's a great thing. You got the microphone? Go, Oscar. Let's lead us in the Lord and lead us in a prayer, and we'll receive uh, our morning offering. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for the love and blessing you provide for us, Lord. Thank you for all you've done for us and our families. I also pray for the men and women who are in Afghanistan, especially our servicemen and service women, who are protecting the, those who are in danger of this Taliban. Take care of those who are traveling. Take care of those who are sick. Lord, take care of Miss Jean.
Take care of my dear brother-in-law who just recently lost his mama last night. Take care of all of us, Lord, with us on this day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's join together singing. I was buried beneath my shame. Who carried a kind of weight? It was mine too. Well, I I was breathing, but not alive. All my failures I tried to hide. It was my dream till I met you. You call my name. darkness into your glorious day you call my name I ran out of that grave out of the darkness into your glorious day Now your mercy has saved my soul. Now your freedom is all I know. The old made new. Jesus, when I met you, you call my name. I ran out of that grave, out of the darkness, into your glorious day. Call my name, I ran out of that grave, out of the darkness, into your glorious day. Rescue my sin was heavy. Change break at the weight of your glory. I needed shelter. I was an orphan. You called me a citizen of heaven. Well, I was broken. You were my healing. 
Now your love is the air that I'm breathing. I have a future, my eyes are open. Cause when you call my name, I ran out of that grave. Out of the darkness into your glorious day. You call my name. I ran out of that grave. Out of the darkness into your glorious day. How would you like to be a guy named Lazarus? And somebody comes up and goes, hey, my name is uh, Pastor Carl, and uh, just wondered what your name was. My name is Lazarus. I was dead. You know what? All of us who have received Jesus as Lord and Savior can say the same thing. My name is Carl. I was dead in sin. But when I declared Jesus is my Lord and believed in my heart that God raised him from the dead, what happened? I was made alive in him. And that spirit in me, that Holy Spirit, never go away. That, that spirit man will never die. My body's going to go away one of these days, but I'm going to hang around in heaven for eternity. Don't you want to be there? Don't you want to be there? I would expect a more enthusiastic response to that question. But maybe just a, a, a physical expectation. In the darkness we were waiting without hope, without light. Heaven you came right, mercy in your eyes. To fulfill the law and promise, to virgin came the word. From a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt. Praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit, three in one. God I'm coming and to reconcile the lost To redeem the whole creation You did not despise the cross For even in your suffering You saw to the other side Knowing this is our salvation Jesus for our sake you died Pray Till that stone was moved for good, for the Lamb had conquered death. And the dead rose from their tombs, and the angels stood in awe. For the souls of all who come to the Father are restored. And the church of Christ was born when the Spirit lit the flame. Now this gospel truth of old shall not need shall not faint by his blood and in his name in his freedom i am free for the love of jesus christ who has resurrected me praise the father praise the son praise the spirit three God of glory, majesty, praise forever to the King of kings. 
praise forever to the King of I cast my mind to Calvary, where Jesus bled and died for me. I see His wounds, His hands, His feet, my Savior on the cursed tree. His body now and drenched in tears. They laid him down in Joseph's tomb. The entrance by heavy storm, Messiah still and all. is our prayer that we would hear your word that we would take it deep into our heart that we would have a strong response to your call for us to listen and obey it would immediately respond God we wouldn't wait we wouldn't tarry we would do what you call us to do we would bring with us God a desire to please you in every way God to do what you ask us to do in the way that you ask us to do it. So, Father, we pray this, that you would just speak to us through Jackson this morning, that he would open your word, that we would read your word, that we would hear your call to us personally. 
and that we would respond. God, we pray that you would do that miracle of grace on our, for us today, God, that we would be able to leave this place and go do what you called us to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 You may be seated. How are you guys doing today? Good. All right. So you turn your Bibles to Acts 21. Acts 21. We'll have uh, verses up in the screen. If you have your Bible, I would encourage you to turn to it and some, to make some notes. So last week what, uh, we discussed what it meant to live the Christian life. What it meant to live the Christian life. And we talked about recognizing the past, right? Our past selves and moving forward towards the future. Right? We need to learn from our past. We need to plan forward our steps. And we introduced a word, a theological uh, word called justification. Right? Justification means we are not guilty. God takes that guilt away. Right? And this word propitiation, he removes uh, God's punishment and replaces it with God's Son, Jesus Christ. Right? So we, and we talked about fighting our battles daily. How do we live our Christian life? We need to fight our battles daily by knowing your 911 Bible verses, right? So whenever you're in a pinch, when you're in a crunch, well, except if you're camping somewhere and you have to hike 45 minutes away to the site to get a ranger, um, but nonetheless, we can pray and say, Lord, <laughs> things are going south right now. I need help. Right? So what is your 911 Bible verse? And we talked about what it means to be redeemed. Right? Redeem is basically God buying us back from the slave life of sin. Right? He's redeeming us back. Right? And then we need to we need to talk we talked about sanctification being more and more like Christ each and every day. For us as believers, that's where we are at today. Right? If you receive the Lord Jesus Christ as your heart, right? confess Him as your Lord and Savior, we are in the place of uh, sanctification where we, be- where we become more and more like Christ. And then the last step towards that is glorification. That's when we, we die here on earth, right? And then we are glorified, we're raised up as Christ, and we are spent eternity with Him. But we're not dead yet, Right? We're not dead yet. Good news. Okay, you're still here. Okay, so turn to your neighbor and say, you're not dead yet. You're not dead yet. That's right. You're not dead yet. Good news. Whew! You're not dead yet. So what do we do in that period? From now to glorification. And that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about the fact that when you receive Jesus in your heart, you're in this progression of becoming more and more like Christ. And that's what the Christian life is. So the title of the sermon today is Christian Life Part 2. We've been doing a lot of Part 2s, right? Okay? We can do Part 3s as well because there's so much more. And I'm trying to crunch it up in this you know, 45-minute uh, time that we have this morning. So if you look at Acts chapter 21, it talks about this in Paul's journey. Now, this is his third missionary journey, and he's going to report back on what is happening, right? He's going to be reporting back to the church leaders. So Paul meets with the leaders of the church in Ephesus, just as a recap in uh, Acts 20, as his final charge and bids them farewell. He then travels to Miletus, to Kos, then to Patera, then to the Mediterranean Sea, to to uh, Tyre and stays there for seven days, then to Plotimus, then to Caesarea to stay with a prophet named Philip, the evangelist, and Agabus. Today we'll see Paul continue his journey from Caesarea down south to Jerusalem and stays with another host named Mason, right? Uh, before, uh, before this, he's to go to the Jerusalem council. He had a preliminary report. He gives a preliminary report to James, the elder of the church, and what has done uh, through the Holy Spirit into the Gentile mission on what was happening. But so, so in reverence of God's word, we're going to read this short 11 verses uh, in Acts chapter 21, starting with verse 15. So let's go ahead and stand up. Verses are on the screen. You have the Bibles in your hand. So we're going to go ahead and read this. And we're going, to, we're going to close in on verse 21, really. So it says here, After these days he got up ready and started on a way up to Jerusalem. 
Some of the disciples from Caesarea also came with us, taking on uh, to Mason of uh, Cyprus, a disciple of long standing with whom we were to stay. After we arrived in Jerusalem, the brothers and sisters received us gladly. And the following day, Paul went in with us, right, to, to James, and all the elders were present. After he had greeted them, he began to relate to one by one the things which God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. And when they heard about them, they began glorifying God, and they said to him, You see, brother, how many thousands were among the Jews of those who had believed, and they're all zealous of the law. And they had been told about you, that you are teaching all the Jews who are among the Gentiles to abandon Moses, telling them not to circumcise their children nor to walk according to the customs. So what is to be done? Question mark. They certainly uh, hear that you have come. Therefore, do as we tell you. We have four men whom have a vow upon us, taking alongside and purifying ourselves together with them and pay their expense so that they may shave their heads and everyone will know that there is nothing to what they have done, been told about you, but you yourselves know and confirm keeping the law. But regarding the Gentiles, you have believed and sent a letter having decided that they should abstain from meat, sacrifice to idols, from blood that is, uh, and what is strangled, and from sexual immorality. Then Paul took along them the next day, having purifying himself together with them, he went to the temple, giving notice to the uh, completion of the days of purification until the sacrifice was offered to each one of them. Woo! All right, you may be seated. That's a lot right there. And there's, we're going to go through and talk about a little uh, uh, history about the, the, uh, about the rites of purification. So, so the title of the verse is, right, the title of our sermon today is The Christian Life. And when I asked this about you guys last week, is Christianity hard? Yes. Right? Is Christianity worth it? Yes. Is Christianity sometimes painful? Yes. Is Christianity sad sometimes? Yes. You feel lonely sometimes? Yes. But let me tell you, it is so worth it. And some of you guys probably have more testimony than I can share today. As I'm standing here preaching to you, you have many stories of what God has done to see you through. And it is so worth it. So let me implore you guys today as we continue on this text. It is so worth it to follow the Lord, to be steadfast, to persevere during those times of struggles. Because we all have them. So let me continue on to tell you to stay focused in your calling to follow Christ. That is your primary objective. You have to stay focused. And sometimes we live in an age where things can get, this, we can get distracted, and I know what that is. And it says here, this is an example of Paul staying focused as he reports to James, relating to them one by, th- one, by one things which God has done among the Gentiles through his ministry. If we recall Paul's life in Acts chapter 9, verse 1, you remember him? He was there to raise torment on Christians. He was the modern day Taliban. He's the modern day extremist. He's the modern day ISIS, right, at that time, trying to hunt those that oppose his view. These Christians that are they call. People of the way is what they were called. So he would go, he would go there. He was on this horse, on his road to, 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 to Damascus. But what happened? What happened? Jesus came upon him. Right? In verse 6 of chapter 9, it says here, I'm sorry, verse 5, and he said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus whom you're persecuting. But get up, enter the city, and I will, told, I will be a, to, t- to tell you what must, uh, you must do. And the men traveled with him, stu- stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. Saul got up from the ground and through his eyes, though his eyes were, o- uh, were open, he could not see nothing leading him by hand. And they brought him to Damascus for three days without sight, neither eating or drinking. Right? And then a disciple comes by the name of Ananias. 
God says to Ananias, I'm leading you to this place, to this man. This man named Saul of Tarsus, who's raised havoc. I'm a, I have some plans for this man. Verse 15, but the Lord said, go, for he is chosen instrument of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles and the kings and the sons of Israel. I will show him how much he will suffer in behalf of my name. That was for Paul. But perhaps something is different, may be different in your life. You might not be a Paul. I understand that. You might be just who God created you to be. And God has greater plans for you to stay focused. So I'm just telling you, uh, as an encouragement to you today, stay focused, stay on course. Have you guys ever done this before early, maybe in your teenagers when you, when you first got your driver's license? You're driving, and then you're looking at something, and the more you look at it, you kind of veer off, right? Okay? You veer towards it. It's the same thing. In Christianity, if you're, if you're, if you're not focused on Christ as your Lord and your shepherd. And if you're looking around, you're going to fear involuntarily to that, whatever that thing is. And it's a simple analogy. But that's how Christianity is. We have to stay focused and course right now. Such a time as this. And if you don't care about your time, care about your children and your grandchildren and their children. Because America today is very different from America yesterday. The West is different from the way it was back in the day. So in 2021, we face significant, significant challenges. 2020, 2019, we face significant challenges that change the world and how it functions. And you guys know that. You guys live that each and every day. But let me tell you, and let me encourage you, now is the time. Now is the time to continue on what God has for you. Don't shy away. I was telling the youth this morning, you know, you, youth, you guys are all leaders. Don't let anyone talk you out of it. You are not a follower. You are a leader. And it starts with you. It starts with your relationship with the Lord. It is crucial to see that Paul's role as a missionary to nations fulfilled the Old Testament prophecy. He was so gung-ho. Right? God had some greater plan for him. In the fullness of time, God sent forth his son, Jesus Christ. Christ's ministry, Christ's death and resurrection filled the salvation predicted in the Old Testament. It was never God's intention, however, that the saving message would be restricted to the Israel, Israelites. See, God had to use Paul and his credentialing to reach out to the Gentile world. Because if he had none, not done that, you and I would not be here today. Seriously. All right, you can tell I'm not of uh, Jewish descent. Very overtly open, right? But because of Jesus Christ, salvation is open for all people. All people. If Paul had not stayed on course, the trajectory would be different. Yes, he would use other people. It's not just Paul. But through Paul, he had the experience, he had the education, he had the zeal. He stayed on course with what God has for him. I'm telling you to stay on course. Stay on course. When God chose Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, he emphasized all nations would be blessed through them. This promise universal, of universal blessing did not become a reality during the Old Testament times. Indeed, the Lord did not intend for nations to be saved on the large scale until the coming of Jesus Christ. The glory of Jesus is maximized when people of the world are saved by calling on his name. Man. Amazing. So you think about that. Think about all those people that you encounter each and every day that may dif be different, may not go to our church, may not go to church at all. Do you know you're an ambassador to share the good news to that person? And, it, and, 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 it, and what's great about it, it's, it's like a test. It's like, okay, before I share the gospel, I'm like, am I right with the Lord? You've got to be right with the Lord first. 
You have to be so right with the Lord. And God uses you. Even God uses your failures to share to others, right? As Paul did. So, Pastor, you're probably saying, well, what are you telling me? Be obedient to your calling first in Christ. As a confessing and baptizing believer of Jesus Christ, which is the first step, then God is going to reveal his plans for you. God has great plans for you. Each one of you, your plans may be different from mine. I did not write the script. When someone, I got saved, I said, hey, you know what, Lord, I think I'm called into ministry somehow, but you know that man that's preaching right there? Not what, I'm, not what he's doing. I'm more of a one-on-one -on -one type person, you know, kind of behind-the-scenes person. But God had to work my heart, right, over these years. And I had to, it was war. I mean, it was on. Until I realized, Lord, you know what? I can't win with you. I cannot win. But that's my story. You have stories yourself. You have lives that you're living where God is telling you, Lord, get right with me. Because I'm going to do amazing things in your life. Stay on course. Stay on course with the objective. And God is going to do amazing things. Now, let me just tell you guys. I know you guys have been praying for me and being very supportive for me and my family. This week alone, I attended two funerals this week. Two funerals. One was the name by the name of Pura Hinahosa, which is my brother-in-law's mom. She was a lady, she was a pastor's wife for many years, over 50 years. And how many churches... Her and her husband planted. Wow. And, and what's amazing is at the, the tail end of the funeral, this was held in, in, the, um, in Katy, at the tail end of the funeral, they had this gentleman that came and gave her husband, right? You know, when, you, when, when we lose a, a soldier uh, overseas or, 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 or whatnot, they give him the American flag, right? That's in, 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 in a case. And this gentleman gives her the Christian flag. To her husband. Well done, good and faithful servant. Man, my I was literally, I'm watching my kids there and Joy over there. We're sitting in the back. I'm like, wow, when I die, that's what I want. And I went to another funeral. My good friend Dennis Perry yesterday held at Houston's First in Cyprus. Our pastor, Greg Mott, was able to preach about that. And this man was born in Dallas and being a minister for over 46 years. Over 46 years. Led my pastor to the Lord. Led many people to the Lord who are in ministry today because of him and his work. And died at the ripe age of 67. I'm looking and I'm like thinking, yesterday, as we're trying to process this with the kids, thinking, when I die, you know, these two people that we attended the funeral this week, that's what I want my funeral to be. Well done, good and faithful servant. They stayed the course. They stayed the course. So I share this with you to focus on Christ because it's really what it's all about. The job will always be there. The bills will always be there. Those employees will always be there. You know what I'm talking about. If you have a business or, right, if you're managing people, the problems will always be there. The policies will be there. The procedures will be there. Don't get lost with your course in the Lord. Because it will be one day that you will die. I will die. How are you going to live and pass on the legacy to your sons, to your daughters, to your grandchildren? It's going to come. I encourage you to stay on course. Stay on course. Stay focused. Next, Paul was ready to meet 
in the Jerusalem council. They were needed, there were needed steps to ensure that he goes through the Jewish customs first. So as we read that long 11 passage about ceremonial laws, and this is what it is. So this is a review of ceremonial laws, which is important. And I think it hits on to where we're going here. So remember, this Paul was not shrinking back on his old ways because of the law of purification. Instead, he regained ceremonial purity by the seventh day a ritual of purification before he could present himself in the ceremony with the four Jewish Christians. So basically, what happens is, is that before you approach in Jewish culture, you have this ceremonial purification of seven days. You bathe, you bathe, you bathe. That's why there's, if you go to Israel today, I've not been there, I've seen pictures, but there's a whole bunch of bathhouses that they were able to uncover. Because in Jewish culture, right, when you, when you, uh, you in order to approach the throne of God, you have to be pure. You have to cleanse yourself for days upon days, right? This includes, right, uh, uh, having uh, have childbirth and postpartum. You have to cleanse yourself before you can approach the temple of God and to be around people. Uh, and if you're a lady and you're having your monthly cycle, that's what you do. You have this ritual of purification, right? If you have um, if you have skin disease or if you're close in contact with someone that has died, you have to follow this this ritual of purification through water because the water is symbolizes symbolizes the Lord cleansing you, and that's what Jewish people do that today, amazingly. But if you notice the water, the water cleanses us, and that's Christ Jesus. So, so, so we have to, as part of our, our journey, we have to realize, we have to realize God is cleansing. He's, he's forgiven us from our, our sins from the past, the present, and the future. And we need to live according to his standard. See, the Christian life is doing what you can do to bridge God and his people. So Paul comes in and he realizes that people were still in, accustomed to Judaism. So he's like, what do we do with that? So he addresses five issues here, but we're going to talk about only two issues because for the sakeness of time, we're going to talk about what it means, right? What it means to go through the Mosaic law. And then we're going to talk about what it means of circumcision. But see, Paul does this. He was so sold out in his, 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 his point of focus of reaching those that are lost that he says this in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 20. To the Jews, I became like a Jew to win Jews. To those under the law, I, because I, like those under the law, I, I, though I myself am under the, no law, as to win those under the law. So he's saying, I can do whatever I can to win those for Christ. So this, he had to follow these rituals, although he's thinking, yeah, I know, I know Jesus saves, right? I don't have to go through this ritual, but... That was the thought of that time. So he goes and he, 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 he makes himself a servant. See, I think in order for us to reach our focus point of glorifying God, we have to be servants. We must do anything without sin, obviously, without compromising ourselves to win those for Jesus Christ. And that's what he did. He clarified it in these two areas. So my point number two is a new life in Christ Jesus is what matters most. Your end goal is to salvage relationships so that people can come to the knowledge of Christ. And you're probably thinking, well, I'm not a pastor. What do I do? You're not. Thank God you're not. (laughs) Right? It's hard work. But you are missionaries wherever you are, and it starts at home. It starts at home. So whatever you can do to share, to disciple those of your children, it starts at home. Could it be reading time with them, spending time, one-on-one time? And as my kids get older, I get to go out with them. My little girls, I get to go out on dates with them. I can show them what a true gentleman should do with these girls, with my girls. Right, And then Joy goes out with my boys, and my boys exercise how to open the door and things like that. And they, you know, how to treat a lady. That's discipleship, y'all. It's not discipleship, it's not just here at church. Discipleship is at home, in your marriage, how it plays out in your relationship with your children. How you talk to your children. 
So he goes and he says, you know, what matters most, I care about that person. I'll do anything so that I can share the gospel to that person. I could disciple that person. That's what these two people that I went to, uh, their funeral, they exhausted themselves so much for the gospel that, that they became a bridge so that others can come in the knowledge of the Lord. One thing I can share about my friend Dennis is, is that this, ki- this, this 67-year-old man was really a kid at heart. And what's crazy is one of my, when, we, when, we, when they would watch our kids, because you know, they don't have grandparents here that live in the state, right? So they became our pseudo-grandparents for our, my children, believe it or not. And, and one thing about Dennis Perry that you guys don't know, he, he loved movies, but he also loved Dr. Pepper. So he had his theater room, he had a theater room, right? And it's filled with Dr. Pepper. And at, at, at an age of, I believe, five or six for Hannah, uh, Hannah, you know, Hannah being five or six that time, she, she would call Mr. Dennis, she would call him Mr. Dentist for whatever reason. And this is what she said to, 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 to me and Joy, well, I hope Mr. Dennis loves his wife more than Dr. Pepper because the whole room, like his theater room was full of Dr. Pepper. That's just who he was. He was a kid. But he was so good at making and being a bridge to anyone from Whataburger to uh to Cypress Breakfast House that him and I would go to, any place, he was so good at creating and building that relationship. Why? It's because he focused on the Lord. And he knew to be a bridge, you had to be a bridge somehow. And he knew enough after 46 years in ministry how to talk to people. Man, amazing. It's not just for ministers to do that. It's for you and me. (laughs) We could do that as well. And you have specific skills that God's given you. Today we talked about spiritual gifts for the youth. Do you know you have a spiritual gift? And those spiritual gifts may not be apparent right away, but it's there. It just takes time to cultivate. It takes time to to, to mature, and you'll see it come through. As parents, I want to encourage you guys Cultivate those relationships with your children. If they are a professing believer of Christ Jesus, baptized, right? And confess Jesus as their Lord and Savior, they have a spiritual gift. Amazing. Cultivate that. And in order to do that, you can't do that behind a remote control. You've got to do that. You've got to be involved in their life. You know, one thing I enjoy with my kids is that they love to eat just like their daddy. I, I go figure, right? We always do something. We eat. We have fun. You know, we do that. Man, I wish, I could, I wish I'm telling you to do that for your children. And then after that, they're going to see mom and dad do this. They're going to start doing that themselves, trying to build relationships with others that do not know because, because it matters with the new life that's changed for the gospel of the Lord. And that's what Paul did. He clarifies these two areas that we're going to talk about, the Mosaic law and the law of circumcision. But let me share this about the new life. You know, in my line of work, uh, we, have, we see kids that are very, very ill. Very, very ill. Some of them have had transplants. Some of them are waiting for a transplant because that's the only option. They come from all over the world to come to Houston to seek care for their son and their daughter. They're willing to leave anything and everything behind for the sake of their son and daughter's life. And what's interesting about transplant is these kids get on the list. Well, first of all, they have to find a a, a hospital that would do this high-risk transplant, this high-risk surgery. So they go and they have this, it's called a pre transplant assessment well the doctors and coordinators and things like that and my staff will review all the medical records and to see if they are a candidate for transplant but one thing about transplant that people don't really talk about as they wait on this if they get on the list one thing that they they don't realize is that somebody has to die to give their son and daughter the organ that they're needing We don't make up organs in the lab. 
Somebody has to die. And for that parent to say, hey, this is it, or for the doctor to say, I'm sorry, we can't save your son and daughter anymore. And, and, and they have to go to the uh, organ, trans, uh, organ donation program. We have one here in Houston, the largest, called Life Gift. Their office is right there by Reliant Stadium. And what's, that's what they do. They have teams of doctors and surgeons waiting on the call. Whenever somebody dies, they go there. And once the family approves, they go there. And then they, they, they go into surgery. And they remove that organ. And then they put it in the, in the box. And they fly it to whatever hospital where the child is literally waiting. They're in death's door waiting. Machines all over the body. Lines all over. IVs all over the body. Waiting for a lung. Waiting for a heart waiting for liver, waiting for kidneys, waiting for intestines. That's what they do. Waiting for cornea, your lens, and your eye. But somebody has to die in order for someone to be saved. Guys, let me point it out to you. Christ died for us. Christ died for you and me. What are we going to do with it? And one of the things that people don't understand about transplant is, is, is that once you have the transplant, you are in forever on anti-rejection medications. Why? Because your body will normally reject this foreign organ that's implanted in you. There's aftercare, there's follow-up, there's labs, and all these different things that you've got to do. And what's, what, what's troubling is, is that I hear sometimes my staff telling me, hey, we gave this, you know, this child got transplanted, but everything's turned it out so well that they stopped taking their anti-rejection medication. And they're now under rejection the second time. What a waste of an organ. Because remember, somebody had to die in order for that person to give that organ to. So I'm asking you, church, what are you doing with the heart, with the organ that, of salvation that God's given you today? Yes, there are challenges that we face in life, but don't get sidetracked. Stay on course with God, what God has given you, freedom, freedom to share the gospel. So Paul goes and he, he, he clarifies these things because what was happening is there's a vacuum that happened, right? A vacuum. I'm not talking about Dyson vacuum, okay? All right? There's a vacuum that happened where, where these Jews that became Christians, now they're thinking, so what do we do with this Jew Jewish tradition? And he talks about five things, and we're going to talk about two. Number one, number one is what do I do with the law? Because remember, Jews, they were zealous for the law. They followed the law to the... To, to, to the T. And there are three classifications of laws. There are moral laws. There are ceremonial laws and civil laws in, the, in Jewish culture. But when Jesus comes, he, he says, you know, the ceremonial, I, I, I am the perfect sacrifice. So there's no more, there shouldn't be ceremonial laws anymore. And there's all these civil laws that, 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 that was added to, no more. But the moral laws, the moral laws are eternal. Thou should not kill. Thou should not steal. Thou should not covet. Right? Thou should not commit adultery. Honor the Lord. One God. Those are eternal. So he goes and he clarifies this and he talks about this because it revolves under sin. William Tyndale, the great uh, reformist, says this, We are not sinners, not because we break the law. We break the law because we are sinners. See, when we sin because we have the nature that wants to sin and rebel against God, the only way to overcome sin is the new nature. That's what we've been talking about. The transplant that you and I receive. This truth must sink into one's being if we are to understand God's revelation about sin, righteousness, and man's condition. Apart from such understanding, everything God has revealed in the Bible about sin will be misunderstood. If you, if you don't understand that, you totally negate the whole aspect of salvation. 
See, God gave Israel the Mosaic law for one purpose, to reveal sin and to condemn sin. Romans chapter 3. We're all sinners. But he, he says, you know, don't stay in your sin. Because the law only does one thing. It's to tell you you're guilty. But see, God comes and he takes the place of. And Paul Paul, Paul talks about this in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 8 to 11. But we know that the law is good. If one uses it for law, lawfully, right? Laws are good. It's not like nullified. It's, it's not, not that it's not good. It's actually good. Realizing the fact that the law is not made for righteous person, but for those who are lawless and rebellious, for the ungodly, the sinners, the unholy, the profane, for those who kill their fathers or mothers, for the murderers, the immoral men, the homosexuals, the kidnappers, the liars, the perjurers, and whatever else is contrary to sound teaching, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God which I have been entrusted to. So the law is good. You just don't say we're going to abandon the law. That's what he's trying to kind of build a bridge on. The other thing was the law of circumcision. Circumcision. So you see, circumcision was an integral part of the nation of Israel, starting with Abraham, the father of God's chosen people in Genesis chapter 17. It was required for every male Jewish boy that on the eighth day, the flesh of his foreskin of his male organ was to be cut as a sign of the Abrahamic covenant. But what was happening? This command was reinforced in the Mosaic law, which declared on the eighth day the flesh of the foreskin shall be circumcised. This practice was indeed to be a picture of what must happen to the heart. So what was happening is, is that people were thinking, hey, you know what? As long as I get circumcised physically, I'm, 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 I'm a believer of the Lord. No. So what was he saying? He's saying this picture... This pictured the reality that one must have his heart pierced and cut to the core and, uh, and, and shaped by two-edged sword with the Word of God. The heart must be set apart to God. Romans chapter 2, verse two, uh, 25 to 29 says this, For indeed circumcision is of the value if you practice the law. But if you are a violator of the law, your circumcision are turned into uncircumcision. So if the uncircumcised man keeps the requirements of the law, will his uncircumcision not be regarded as circumcision? Verse 28, he who is physically uncircumcised, if he keeps the law, he will not judge you, who, though having the letter of the law in the circumcision as a violator of the law. For he is not a Jew who is uh, one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew who is inwardly the circumcision of the heart, by the spirit, not by the letter. And his praise is not for the people, but from God. So all matters is the heart. Are you circumcised in the heart? Have you been cut to the core for the Lord's instrumentation? That's what's important. Because the Jews did things on the external, but their heart was so far from it, wasn't it? Right? So when it talks about three more things that we don't have time about, meat sacrificed to idols, blood that is strangled, and sexual immorality, but I'll save that for you to read. See, a new life in Christ means, and Jeremiah says this best, 31, Jeremiah 31, verse 11, For the Lord has ransomed Jacob, and redeemed him from the hand of him who, who was stronger than he. Verse 12. They will come and shout for joy to the heights of Zion. And they will be radiant over the bounty of the Lord. Over the grain and the new wine, new oil. Over the young of the flock and the herds. And their life will be a watered garden. And they will never languish again. Then the virgin will rejoice with, uh, in a dance. And the young men and the old together. For I will turn their mourning into joy and comfort and give them joy for their sorrow. It's all about the new heart. We can do things for the law, but if the law leaves us nothing, leaves, leaves our hearts unchanged, it's useless. But Christ, Christ changes everything. 
See, as a Christian, in our Christian path, we need to know, we need to share people that, man, the life that you're living, there's so much more that God could offer to you. First, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 16, I remember this growing up as a, as a Christian, young Christian. Therefore, from now on, we recognize that no one by flesh, even though we have known Christ by the flesh, yet now we know him in this way no longer. He's saying, don't go with the old life anymore. There's a new life. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, this person is a new creation. The old things have passed away. Behold, new things have come. Now all these things are from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. You're a new Christ, new being in Christ. New. Go after that. It starts with you. And after that, share that with others. Share it. Share it. Be courageous. Be a leader. Share it. When things are going away down at work, we, the three of us, as my team, we, we get together. We pray in a secular institution. Believe it or not, people want God. Quite the contrary from what this world tells you. Oh, we can't talk about God. Yes, you can. You have freedom to do so. You have freedom, every freedom to do so. Now, your heart has to be right. Your behavior if you can't finish projects and you're coming up to, uh, to work late, having two-hour lunches, and you're saying, hey, let's get to pray together, probably that's what they're going to think Christianity is, and they're going to be rejecting that, right? But if you work hard, diligently, and your action, not to say that you're perfect, your action reflects that of wanting to live a new life, man, people are going to be attracted to you more than you think. Billy Graham says this, being a Christian is more than just an instantaneous conversion. It is a daily process whereby you grow to be more and more like Christ. That's where we are. You're not dead yet. Remember that? You ain't dead yet. You got life to live. Live it for the Lord Jesus. In closing, if we care about new life, what about those areas where there's no freedom, no law? No government, no rights, no protection. I want to encourage us as a church to be aware of what's going on to those around us, our brothers and sisters in the Lord. So I'm going to have Joy come up here. Um, she's going to share something about where we are and what we, my challenge for us as a church um, from this day forward. I'll grab the mic here. And we're going to talk about what has been happening in Afghanistan, and um, so I'm going to give the mic to to my wife. <laughs> She's looking at me like really weird. Um, put her on the spot, right? That's right. So, so if you guys know, uh, if you guys have been watching media, right? Uh, I don't care what news it is. You, it, it's hard to deny what's happening in Afghanistan, and literally, people are going to die. If they've not died, they will die this week. They'll die today. These Christians that are minorities in the world of majority Muslim. And these are not nice Muslims. These are Muslims that will terrorize you and butcher you because of what they believe in. So I have brought Joy here. She kind of read a little something about what we need to do. And I'm going to have a challenge for us as Christians today. Right here, yeah, in our church. Uh, in, on behalf as we... Um, as we intercede for our brothers and sisters in Afghanistan. Go ahead. Well, I was just sharing with Jackson that I've been reading through several different things, whether it's Open Door Ministries or whether it's Voice of the Martyrs. Um, but our Christian brothers and sisters are in dire straits over in Afghanistan. And there's been a call for us as Christians to pray and to fast for them. Um, there's a small window still open where some of these people could be rescued and could be taken out. But from what I understand is that the Christians are not part of those groups who will be rescued. And so they are literally going to be left there um, with no protection. So what happened is about a year and a half ago, uh, the church in Afghanistan began to grow. 
And um, they have about 20,000 people now who um, are Christians, which is a very small number, but they are growing fast. And these people are those who were Muslim and have converted to Christianity, which is against the law. So they all have identification cards, and on their identification cards, it has that they were Islam. And so the leaders of these families, because you have more protections if your family has always been labeled as Christian, you can continue to be a Christian, although you don't have the same rights as all the others. So these families decided that they were going to take a stand and they were going to put themselves out there for persecution, but the leaders, for the sake of their children and for the sake of standing up for Christ, were going to change on their cards that they now were Christians. And so I believe, if I heard correctly, I've heard a a few different versions of when exactly it happened, But from what I understand, it was in January that they made this official and that they updated their cards. And so because of this, the Taliban who has come in now has um, the ability to be able to look into all of the documents of the government and they know exactly who all of these people are because now their cards are registered as Christian. And so they are getting letters that say, we know who you are. And we're coming for you. And so we have been asked as a church, as their brothers and sisters in Christ, to pray and to fast this week that God would open up opportunities for these different ministries because they have no international protection, but that these ministries will have an open door to be able to go in, to be able to even just be able to pull a few out. And so I guess what we're asking for this morning is that we spend some time in prayer um, and that each of our families would consider what maybe a day of fasting or fasting from a meal or fasting for um, however long it is that God calls you to and to pray for these people and pray for their strength. I remember when I was, um, when I was in high school and I started to grow in my faith and I remember reading about people who gave their life for the Lord and I remember praying and saying, Lord, make me strong enough so that if this ever happened to me, that I would have the strength to be able to stand and not deny my Savior. And so we are praying for that same strength, for a great strength to be filling each of these families, and they're praying specifically for their children because they're not worried about their own lives, but they're worried about what's going to happen to their kids. Thank you, Joy. So I want to spend some time before we go into the Lord's Supper to be praying. Um, I want us to, if we can break up into three different groups. So one group here, one group there, and I can just bunch this group together. This is your time. Uh, If we can have some music playing in the background. uh, This is your time. I want us to spend at least about five minutes to be praying. And the challenge is, the challenge is, is to be praying consistently for this group of believers in Afghanistan and that there would be protection and rescue. So the challenge is is to be praying and to be fasting at some point this week for our brothers and sisters. So let's go ahead and do that. So group one, group two, and group three, if I can have people there lead and then close uh, for about five minutes, we want to spend time doing that.
done, you can have a seat. Thank you so much. Take a seat. You know, I think we as a church need to be aware of what's going on. There are so many needs. And I think the devil does all he can to distract us, right? Mm -hmm. But it's good to pray together. That's what intercessory prayer is. We're interceding on behalf through the Holy Spirit to answer our prayers. Some of you guys are know the reason why you're here is because of intercessory prayer. I am one of those people. But nonetheless, we've got a lot going on. So be aware. I challenge you, church, be aware. Fast. Intercede for our brothers and sisters to be saved. Right. So now this is the time I, I encourage you guys as we move towards our observance of the Lord's Supper. Today we'll be taking the Lord's Supper. So if I can have the ushers come in, uh, and I want you guys to stand right beside me. Okay, there you go. Got two more right there. Stand to my left. All right, thank you so much, good gentlemen. The Last Supper, Jesus shared a meal with his disciples, then led them to observe the Feast of Unleavened Bread, or Passover. See, Jesus was the master teacher and used this opportunity to plant an important memory in his disciples gathered in the upper room. Jesus shared this meal for their benefit and ours. As Jesus raised the bread and cup in thanksgiving, he added new significance in the meaning of the word Passover. You see, Luke 22 records that Jesus told his disciples to observe the Passover in remembrance of me. Jesus took an old symbol and filled it with a new meaning. The meaning of Jesus' words and actions is rooted in his command to remember. As today's disciples, we observe the Lord's Supper in remembrance of the sacrifice of Christ Jesus made for us in his suffering and death on the cross. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul gives instruction concerning the Lord's Supper. In doing so, he reminds the Corinthian Christians two things. Number one, their personal salvation in Christ Jesus, that this is only for believers to partake, and that the participation is a, in, in the Supper carries inward and outward aspects. Inwardly, 
participants are to examine themselves spiritually before taking the supper. Outwardly, participants proclaim through the supper the Lord's death until he returns. verse 19 says this when he had taken some bread and given thanks he broke it and gave it to them saying this is my body which is given for you do this in remembrance of me let us partake of the bread first corinthians eleven twenty-five says in the same way he took the cup also after the supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let us partake of the blood. Father in heaven, we come before you. Thank you so much. I know there's a lot today, a lot to think about, a lot to be praying about a lot of people's lives in your hands. Lord, I pray as this little church here in Waller come before you, that you'd hear our hearts, you'd hear our broken hearts. Lord, we need you to intercede for us, for our families, for our children, for our grandchildren. 
We ask for you to intercede on behalf of Christians abroad, especially those in Afghanistan and many others. Father, we come before you, Lord. We give you thanks, Lord. You know, we know that you are God that hears us. You're a God that never forsakes us, Lord. We thank you and celebrate the many miracles each and every day of what you do for us. Lord, I want to say thank you. So we come before you as we lead and exit this building. Lord, help us to forge forward, to not think of the things that don't really matter in life. Lord, to think of you, to think of what you've done for us and to share the new life, potentially, because of our personal testimony and story. Lord, I pray that you'd use us, Father, to be instruments, tools, vessels, Father, for your great name. It doesn't matter how young, no matter how old, Lord. It doesn't matter if we're working or not, we're retired. It doesn't matter, Lord, we have a job because we are still alive and we be, are being renewed daily and daily to be more and more like you father use us father in Christ's name amen amen uh, well let me uh, close this off and just want to say thank you so much for being here for those that are tuning in online we got great we've got an exciting week a week from today the 29th Again, we're going to have service, and then we'll have a potluck. We'll provide all the, the hamburgers and buns, etc. I want you to bring sides and your favorite toppings. We'll have Pastor Hanny and his wife to be here with us, to join us. Uh, we'll have Q&A session, uh, and then we'll call, call a special business meeting on to vote whether this man is the pastor, the associate pastor for our church, for our youth. And then after that, we will have our third quarter business meeting right here. I encourage you guys to all come to see what's going on at our church. Yes, uh, and the, 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 the um, uh, bulletin, uh, we have all the, the notes for our, uh, at our third quarter meeting and the packet for Pastor Hanny in the foyer. Please feel free to grab those and read through them. Uh, as we will have the agenda items set for our, our meetings. So thank you so much. Let me pray us out. Father, we love you. Lord, you are so good. You are so good, Lord. We got work to do. Help us, Lord, to seek your holiness. Help us to seek your righteousness. Help us to seek you, Father, and infiltrate this world for Christ Jesus, your Son, our Savior. Bless us. Bless these family members here. Bless the marriages, bless the children and the grandchildren that are here, hearing the message of hope, and help us to lead them, Lord, to fulfill their role and their passion, Father, for you. In Christ's name we pray, amen. You are dismissed. Thank you.